Welcome. I'm Mariah. I'm the one that's been spamming everybody. <laughs> Hopefully you've not been too spammed, but I've decided to put that as my official title as email spammer. Um, I run Women Who Go, which we ran out of weave. Uh, we're putting on this meetup because this workshop because we love teaching people go. We, I love evangelizing go. That is my one true calling in life. Um, so today we are doing a beginner workshop. Troy is teaching it because he's an expert <laughs> in being a beginner and go. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to give you all the full accreditation desired. Um, but that being said, we do have people here who are also go experts that are here to help. Your Jonathan was here as a go expert to help us, right? I wouldn't say expert anymore. <laughs> and an you are not a go expert? Okay. Ryan did help with the TV. Dang it, I broke it. You just have to press connect again. It just disconnected you. Um, I am also a Go person. Um, I will help. There are some more people coming, so we'll have, if you have questions, have troubles getting set up. I've done Go for a little bit, but no, yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, just mostly like Go, you have to have a dev environment set up, and that can be tricky the first time. So I want to make sure that we get that set up, because once it's set up, everything runs smoothly but we just need to make sure that we can run our computers like we want to run them. So we do have some more people coming for that. Um, Cause I want to make sure that we're all good there. Um, you have all the information I have here. Well, lunch is supposed to be here around 12. So we'll eat. And more than anything else, we want to just keep everything low pressure. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, I'm sure I'll let Troy say anything else he wants to say to introduce people, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, and yeah, I'll throw the time over to you and just keep ushering All people right. back this way. Sounds good. Well, welcome to the Intro to Go workshop. So let's start with some introductions. Um, I feel like we can all introduce each other ourselves, right? There's not that many of us here. Let's just do it. So Stephanie, right? I'm Stephanie. Stephanie. Why don't you tell us? Your name, if you're working somewhere where you're working, and what brought you here today? I work at Nuvi as a QA developer, and what brought me to Go is that we use Go, and I started looking at Go, and I said, I really like Go. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Awesome. All right, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Morris, and I work at uh, Intermountain Security Supply, um, doing whole chain stuff. but. Uh, I used Go at Rack 10 a few years ago, and I haven't had an opportunity to use it since, so I'm just trying to get back into it. We'll just keep going. Uh, I'm Tony. I work here at Weave. Uh, I do level two tech support. Looking to learn Go because I want to get down to dev. Sweet. Yeah. I'm Lindsay. Um, I work on parallel learning with Troy which uh, we're trying to start a dev boot camp for women. So if you have any questions afterwards, come and talk to Troy and I. And that's why I'm here, because I'm his guinea pig. So. Um, I'm Brooke. I work here at Weave, um, the customer success manager. And I am not sure if I want to go the dev direction, so I figured a beginner work would be great. I'm Haley. I work here at Weave. Um, what brought me here is I want to go in development, so it's a good way into it. Safe background on this one. Uh, I, I work here at Weave as well. I'm in customer and tech support with Tony and Haley. Um, I've dabbled a little bit with Java, JavaScript and Python, and I've never actually heard it go until I started working here, and so I want to get into development as well. So. Please. I'm Kyler. I work here as a at Weave as a developer, and I'm here to learn how to do my job so I don't get. <laughs> 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 yeah. sure. I'm Lainey, and I'm Kyler's wife, and I don't want him to get fired, so <laughs> we'll learn some coding so I can help him later. <laughs> um, I'm Olivia. I worked at I am Flash for eight years in finance. 
and I loved building models and figuring out financial models and I wanted to change. So I decided to look into becoming a backend developer. Awesome. So I'm learning, learning Python now, but my plan is to go to Go next, so. I'm Adrian, but I go by 80 and I'm a software engineer at Assure Services. Oh. Yeah, I just wanna learn Go. Awesome. <laughs> what do you use at Assure um, I'm in stack, so. Okay. Cool. I'm Emma Scanlon. <clears throat> I'm a student at Dev Point Labs, which is a coding boot camp in Salt Lake. Um, and I'm just I'm just here because I'm looking to learn anything I can. Oh. I'm Chile. I also work at Weave and I'm a long through Dev and the only thing I've ever been introduced before is Ruby and that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so hoping Go is easier. All right. Cool. My name is Justin. I'm a developer for Sinclair Oil, and uh, I enjoy Go. I've coded in it for the last months, and I just wanted to learn more about it. Cool. Uh, looks like we have a few people trying to sneak in. You're not off the hook, though. So tell us who you are, where you're working, if you're working somewhere, sure. and what brought you here today. So my name is Ulysses. I work at Walmart Labs. I've been doing Go now for Long time. Let's just put it that. Um, and I'm here to. So I'm 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 here to help out. So Mariah and I used to work together at uh, Nav, and uh, super excited that she's kind of taking this on and you know doing the, the meetup. I, I also help run the the Utah Users Go meetup as well. So if you guys have any go questions, like I'm here to help. So I'm um, Jeff. I work at Amazon in Seattle, Yuli's brother-in-law. So <laughs> I've heard, heard, heard good things about Go. Haven't done much. All right, cool. Hey, what was your name? Uh, I'm Curtis. I do contract work for a company based out Portland right now. Um, EdTech. Um, we do Ruby mostly, but Go is my favorite language. So. Cool. All right. And what was your name next to Lindsay? My name is Julie Ford. I uh, work at Nice and Contact in Sandy. Okay, cool. And are you a developer now or? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, um, if you're interested in learning more after today, even though you're going to learn everything you need to, of course, <laughs> um, there's a Women Who Go Meetup, which is run by Mariah. And I can't, I think she does it on Thursdays, like the first Thursday of the month. No, last Thursday of the month. Um, and it's here at Weave generally, and it's great. And it's it's generally tailored towards a more beginner audience, I think. Um, there's also the Utah Go user group, which is also here at Weave, um, and it's also great. And then, like Lindsay mentioned, we're working on a sort of a boot camp for women called Parallel Learning. So if you're interested in that, we were, we're gonna do a beta group this summer, so you can go check out that website. Um, Okay, here's the agenda today. We want to install Go and any tools we need on your laptops. That's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to learn some very basics about programming, which sounds like, how many, of, if, raise your hand if you have like zero experience programming. Okay. Two months. Okay, good. So hopefully that'll be useful for at least someone. And if you have experience programming, you can just kind of tune out or maybe chime in and help explain something a little better than I can. Um, then we're going to practice programming by using Go to do some drawing. And then we're going to create a little chat client to talk to each other. So we can all talk to each other in this room. Um, I don't know how long any of this is going to take, so we could be here all night. Just kidding. Um, but <laughs> we'll just see how far we get. The most important thing is that we can install Go on your laptop so that later you can go home and practice more on your own. Um, so as we're going through this, if any of you have questions or you're feeling stuck or frustrated or if you think I'm explaining something poorly, please, please raise your hand and let me know and like, let's help each other out. Like Mariah said, we can keep this very low key. Um, okay, so first I want to talk a little bit about the command line interface because um, this is something that can be intimidating for people that are new to programming. <laughs> But it's just like a UI. What's a UI? Any guesses? User interface. User interface, which has buttons and text boxes and that kind of thing, and you use a mouse to interact with it. So it's just like a UI, except that you use, you're writing text to interact with your program. So for example, 
um, I can, here's a command line interface right here. I can type in a command called ls, which is gonna list all the folders and files in the directory that I'm in right now. So it's very similar to if I open my finder window. Let's just, and I go to my home folder right here, try shields. You can see that it's got the same stuff. So applications, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I can zoom in, well, not very much. So there's an applications folder in my UI. Here's the applications folder in my CLI following. Um, and just like I can click on this to open the applications folder, I can use a command called CD and then type in the name of the applications folder. And now I'm in the applications folder. And then I can use LS and just see what programs are in there. Cool? So it might seem intimidating, but it's not that different from what you're used to. It's just a different way to interact with your computer. So we're going to do that a little bit today. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, so cool. Okay, now we're gonna jump into the installing stuff portion of today. Um, if you feel like you know what you're doing, just these, this is what we're gonna install. So just you can start Googling VS Code install and go for it. Um, but we'll also check and make sure we're all like doing it together. So uh, we're gonna start with VS Code and I'll explain what that is a little later. But we're going to go to Google, we're going to Google install VS Code. And we're going to click on this download Visual Studio Code Mac Linux for Windows. And then here, go ahead and select the one that you want to install. And I'm going to install it for Mac. I already have it though, but download the zip file and you open that up follow the instructions. So take work on that for a couple minutes. If you get stuck, raise your hand and one of the certified experts will come around. <laughs> you can also help each other out. So, uh, if you're on Windows, then you have to install Git for Windows. If you're on Mac, congratulations, you made the right choice. <laughs> so Google uh, Git for Windows. See, not that one. We're going to go for this Git for Windows.org. This one right here. And then just click download and install that one as well. It'll, it's just like a normal installer. You can just pretty much leave all the defaults that it gives you. Um, Keep going to the next one since not all of you are on Windows, but I'm not going to leave you behind. Don't worry. So if you're on Windows, just st stay on that one, get that installed, but then we'll catch up. Um, for the rest of you, install Go. If you're a Mac user and you use Brew, you can use Brew to install Go if you want. Um, it's just Brew install Go. Uh, if you're not a Mac user and you don't use Brew, then I would just Google uh, go install and click on this getting started the go programming language and then down here you go to Mac OS package installer or the MSI installer for Windows those are the two that I would click on to install go All right, are we still installing? Are we still installing Go? We're gonna have Go installed. Take that as a definitely yes. You have the questions. Raise your hand, and we'll come work out your issues. So the way the way you can verify. Let's verify that we're all at this point at least. So open up your terminal. Remember, command space terminal on Mac. On Windows, you have to go to the Start menu, and then you hit CMD. Yeah. You hit Windows CMD. Okay. So you should be able to run Go Help and 
see something like that. If anyone does not see that or can't get to this part, let me know. That's the part that you want me to go. I think it's time to go. It's like Microsoft paid somebody to maintain that one. Another way is just most of the windows. Shields for me. Yeah. Um, on Windows, it's going to be C drive. The C drive? Just the really happy one. That's where you put your GoPad. Oh, I have no idea. Oh, it's telling you where the whole users, your username. Yeah, that's a, Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's your username in Windows as well. And then you can create, you can right click in here, create a new folder. And we're going to call it Go. So create a folder called Go. Hi, Travis. And your username. Folder, oh, in your own folder. We've been trying to get you into this building forever. Questions about that? Where are we putting that in? Put it in your, your home folder, which is your username. Feel free to take a seat right here. Um, just next to the so on that screen up there, um, found the extension, just press install. Troy, you're just having to create a folder in the users directory then? Yeah, 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 in their home folder. This one, you can pull through extensions by clicking on, okay? Search box, click and go. No, oh, yeah. See, this the map out of right here. Now, these are the to to different extensions that relate to the part code. What's your name again? And one thing that I'll do is I'll look at the numbers. Yeah. So that's good. Any questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah. We've got more people with. Extension. Extension. This next one is like yeah. Yeah, I left. You can see that like. Oh, right there. Yeah. 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 I put all these. Yeah. 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 Visual Studio. Uh, I actually install what it does. Now, so you don't have a username. That's a big player. Visual Studio. It's like a text editor. Yeah, it's not the username. So this one now, now that we've solved the question. But yeah, I may have to go get like everyone created that folder again. Anybody not created the folder? All right. We're making progress. Okay, now we're gonna open VS Code. So open that with however you want. It's gonna look like this. Well, show you how it's going. <laughs> file, oops, file new window for me. It's gonna look like this. Everyone have this open, ready to go? Um, so this is a text editor. We're gonna be writing our Go code in this text editor. It's kind of like Microsoft Word, except instead of creating nice pretty documents, we're creating nice clean code. Um, and we need to install a tool into this text editor. So if you click on the left side, this square thing, and then in the search extensions in market, Marketplace, you should be able to search one called Go 
There should be one from Microsoft called Go. Little gopher. Little gopher. So go ahead and install that. It only has 8 million downloads. <laughs> so it may not be trustworthy. We don't quite trust Microsoft on everything, but we might want to trust them on this plugin. It is a good tool. Soft tool. I'll say, you know, Go is a good programming language because it's got an adorable mascot. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we have stickers to prove it. Yeah, there's a lot of stickers over there. Um, so, anyone having trouble finding that or installing it? Okay, good. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Then, now we want to test it all. So, we're going to test it all in VS Code. Go ahead and hit so. Control tilde on Mac. You're on your own on Windows? It's also about the same. <laughs> and that should open a little terminal at the bottom. Might want to explain what a tilde is. What? Might want to explain what a tilde is. The tilde, the, uh, like the top left. The end squid view. So, oh, no, just pull it out. I'll type it. For Windows people. There, that's the tilde. For Windows people, go to view. You're opening the terminal, right? Yeah. So, if under view. They don't have the shirt. Go down, and there should be the terminal in there. Okay. Yep. So a control tilde on that. Get out of my terminal. Is that okay? So, like I said before, you should be able to type "go help" and have "go" have some help stuff show up. Um, the other thing I wanted to have you try was to use "go install github.com slash Troy Leland Shield slash drawing." Everyone try typing that command in and then hitting enter. Let's see. Go install or somewhere to go. Yeah, try that. Go install. What? Are we going installing again? We're installing. We're installing that. It's so called a package. We're installing that drawing package. Yes, you. Did you try typing that in? Yeah, it's similar. Yeah, like if you have the source and binary directory, then you'll actually install that binary. Okay. Yeah. Type in that. Go install GitHub.com. It will also get you. Uh, so, slash, uh, slash, 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 um, slash drawing. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Well, no, I was just kidding. This one doesn't get it. This is cool. Okay, so seven years before I did that. It changed my life. I still can't figure out. You got the best? Switch between. Okay, so you're going to pull this draw. Uh, command yeah. number, command number. Um, Troy, maybe this. Same Yeah, they're not finding the package. They're saying go install it. Saying it's got to be finding the local package. That's so that's answer right. down. I think you got to do a go get. Yeah, I think you might be. Yeah. Yeah, like it. No, it's not working for go anyone. Get. Yeah. yeah, isn't it go yeah. get? Yeah, we need to go get. <laughs> go get. <laughs> I tricked you off. I just wanted to get a bike to get there. I'll be right back. Yeah. So instead of install, install, just put G E T. Go get. I just wanted to be. <laughs> I told you he was an expert at being a beginner. Yeah. <laughs> okay, try that command. You might have better luck. Now, do you want to do an install afterwards? Or? No. No, no, just go that's, get. That's good. I didn't want you to do an install at all. That was dumb. Um, great. Troy has secret programs he's you installing on your machine, guys. Now you can verify that Did that work better? Yes. Okay. Something's supposed to have happened though? Not really. Just, okay. You just weren't supposed to get in there. Okay. <laughs> um, I challenge you to try to do it all the command. Like, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I 
shows you what's what's in your printer. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sure. And it takes a while, and then, yeah. and then it actually goes. Really okay. It's because it because things uh, off, and then it has to go the yeah, yeah. way it, it, it does. So what I was trying to do there is when Go is actually trying to run a program called Go. Yeah, that's a big thing. the Go program. I got it in 20. Yeah, the very first thing that you type. No, but I'm... That's, that's the update. You want to execute. Okay, so I'm trying to execute Go here. So I'll put it between your And now that's the you should see. And then you'll do a space and you want to change directories to where it's modeled. Like, so they still think it's over. So we're moving together. There you go. Now I'll press it. So now, like this little thing you right have, have I fixed it in videos? Okay. Can I fix it like this? It's your home directory. And then slash go means you're in the go directory. If you type in ls, let's see what it shows. So it says package source. I've got some insider information. Tell you. Source is the source code of um, stuff that you got. In so and then package is, I think that's where it like, compiles it and sticks to it. But anyways, going to the source. Uh, no, I expected the. Uh... Oh, that's not going to work. Good job. You're supposed to type CD source. No, um, change directory. But you're in there. So type ls. And so now you've got those two folders. So CD and uh, GitHub. Or just type GitHub. to guess what you need to type out. Go give you some suggestions. So here, it guessed, oh, you want to see Detroit and Michael Shields. There's no press in there. So, so this guy as well. Look at that. You guys are drawing. So, um, so here it's giving you two options. If you really want to go to command filter or go. Or you can type out, and so if you type in A, <laughs> then it happens. So now, what's different here is it's showing this green thing that says master. You're inside of what's called a, a Git repo. Repository. And so a repository is this place where you can collect code and do the changes to the code will keep track of the changes that you make. So you can still change the minute you decide, oh, oh it's working here. There's something about and you're like, okay, terminal out of it. Yeah, that's fine. You just won't be able to add it all up together, but it's okay. Um, and it's also a way of um, it's to try running that, go get. Thanks, sorry about that. No? Different projects that you're doing. And it's Anyone else stuck on this part? Other developers, because they'll make changes to the same code that you're working on. And it's like, you want to verify that that works for everyone? changes If you do the go get. Yeah. So, oh wait, did I take that away too soon? Yeah, oh, there, we go. there it is. Go, go get github.com slash drawing. You good? So far. Okay, cool. Does that, everything make sense? Yeah, fun. I did a crash course on this. Awesome. So, okay. So, now, okay. So, I'm going to verify that that. 
We just installed some Go code on your computer. Cool. I just want to verify that it worked for everyone. So everyone click open, open, and then in your finder window, it should probably start around your, on your home folder. So find that Go folder you created. And inside of there, do you see an SRC folder? Okay, <laughs> click on the SRC folder. And then do you see a github.com folder? Okay, click on that one. And then do you see a Troy Leland Shields folder? Okay, click on that folder and then click open. And you should have on the left that drawing. Uh -huh. so, you see that drawing folder on the left? Once we open the Troy one. Yeah, so open Troy Leland Shields. Okay, so. Yeah. Let's leave the work. You set up for Go Password? Uh, I didn't set it up, it's just in the default. Okay. It's in the default under Go so, Source. Yeah. Probably see when those users. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Windows users. Okay, so and her username. I mean, I'm drilling down. Uh, so we're in the wrong place. Yeah. Or C users. Go. Oh, it's the wrong one. Go back to. Because mine wasn't in users. Notice this one's outside of users. That was in. That one's okay. That one's the Yeah, good. And I made it go. Because we just created a cycle. Right? Yeah, that one probably yeah. stay in your users folder. Yeah, that okay. one's cool. Oh, okay. And it's then, just, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. So, um, that's the And you want choice. Oh, unrecognized it for a bit. <laughs> oh, does it, it needs to be github.com. Oh, so it, it worked the second time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, see, yeah, there it goes. So, okay, now you can have this folder in drive. Yes, yeah, I'm in there right now. Examples. You're good. Just the whole folder. Mac, you're good. I'm good. Um, so, Thank you, sorry about that. Echo. All right, anyone else? Anyone having problems? So doing good? Okay, so then. Should we get into the fun stuff now? Export. Hey. So I usually just set it as a environment variable on my VHS. And just double click. Alright. The VHS actually. Yeah, VHS. Yeah. So you can just export GoPath equals. All right, I got it. Tough question. What does it mean to program an alarm clock? Tell it what time to go off. Tell what time to go off. Okay. How do you do it? What? Okay. You have an alarm clock or we don't have an alarm clock? It's a normal alarm clock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what would the variable be that you say? Uh, AM or PM or? All right. Maybe just the time it needs to go off. Uh, yeah, I think programming an alarm clock really isn't that different than programming a computer to do anything else. It's just that an alarm clock has like one function it can do. It can either make sound or not. And it might be able to, you might be able to change some of the parameters there. Like maybe it can play the radio or maybe it can play an annoying buzzing sound. Um, but you set up those, that program that you want it to go off at 3 a.m. I don't know why. And you want it to play the radio and then that happens. Um, well, we're programming a computer, but the amount of things that our computer can do is vastly wider. Um, so we're gonna learn about programming a computer today. It's not that different from programming an alarm clock. Um, so what is a programming language? Any, uh, anyone wanna take a crack at it? Okay, so now we're gonna yeah. So, like, what language do our computers speak? Binary. Binary. They only know numbers. And specifically, they only really know two numbers. Um, but we don't know numbers because we use English and words. So the programming language is to help us communicate from English to numbers that the computer understands. 
So it's something kind of like English, but not that close to English, but it's way further away from binary than we want to deal with. Does that make sense? So it's to help us communicate to the computer to tell it what we want it to do. Um, Go is a great language. We already talked about how they have such a cute mascot. Uh, it's also a good language because they, the creators of the language really emphasize simplicity, um, which is one of the reasons I like it. It's, it might be hard for a beginner because there's not as many resources available for beginners as there are for like JavaScript, but that doesn't mean it's a bad language for beginners. It just means you might have to do a little more digging. Um, it's a good language for beginners because it is so simple. Um, let's see, it's, it's generally used as a back-end language. Does anyone know what back-end versus front-end means? Server-side versus what you see in the browser. Yeah, so when you're browsing, for example, my favorite website, airbnb.com, um, there's the code that's running on your computer in your browser, and it looks nice and pretty. And then there's the monster that Airbnb's created that's running on their servers in their data center somewhere. So this is the front end code that you see, and then there's the back end code that's helping to support all this. So Go is used on the back end. Again, if you have any questions or anything, just shout them out. Um, okay, so we're just gonna dive into some important programming concepts. And again, this is, tailored towards those of you that maybe haven't programmed before. Um, and I'm afraid that even after we go over these concepts, you still might be like, what the hell? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, you have to start somewhere. So just like glean what you can. And hopefully as we start going through this, seeing some more examples and stuff, um, I hope that having gone through these sort of vocab words might help. So one of the vocab words we're gonna talk about, there's seven. One of them is data types. Uh, we're gonna play a little game. I've never done this, so let's see how it goes. Uh, I need someone to shout out an adjective. An adjective. Oh. What? Happy. Happy. <laughs> I need another adjective. Brown. What? Brown? Brown. Does that work? I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> Gopher. Oh. <laughs> Just describing the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Castle. 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 Oh. Oh, Tacos. Tacos are good. Yeah. <laughs> Game. Okay. Plural noun again. Uh oh. I need another plural noun before we get that ing verb. People. People. Now I need a verb ending in ing. Running. And one more verb ending in ing. Swimming. Cool. Need a sporty math lab. <laughs> you may have guessed that we're doing a math lab. Uh, so let's see what we got. A vacation is when you take a trip to some happy place with your brown family. <laughs> usually, okay, my family's last name is Brown, so. Uh, usually you go to some place that is near a gopher or up on a castle. A good vacation place is one where you can ride tacos <laughs> or go hunting for people. <laughs> um, I like to spend my time running and swimming, running or swimming. Uh, cool. So, just like this set, this story had to have an adjective right here. It would not have worked if we had put it down there. It would have been a square peg in a round hole like I had right here. Um, so this sentence is sort of like a certain type of word that fits in there, which is similar to how your computers are working. When you write a program, there's certain parts of the program where it's expecting a certain type of data. Um, and it's not quite like the parts of speech that we have, but it's a similar idea. So we're gonna talk about those types of data. Um, first one we're gonna talk about is an int, which is just a number. You might use an int to represent someone's age or their bank account or something. Um, the next one is a string, which you can remember because it's like a string of characters. 
So you might use a string to represent someone's name. It's important to note here that this string five is different than this int five. Does that make sense? They're kind of, even though they look the same to us, the computer is differentiating between these things because one is a number and it knows it's a number. The other one it knows is just a string of characters. Um, if you wanted to convert between the two, you could, but the computer isn't gonna automatically be able to know that those two things are the same. Another one is called a Boolean, which is a scary term that when I went through my first computer science class, they seemed to think that I should already know what that word means, uh, which I didn't, but it's named after a mathematician and it all it means is true or false. So it's either true or it's either false. It's never anything else. Um, you might use a Boolean for, I don't know, what would we use a Boolean for? If I'm using- In real life or in code? Either. <laughs> Uh, okay. Alarm clock is on. True yeah. or false? Yeah, whether or not the alarm clock is set. She or loves on. me. She what? loves me not. <laughs> she loves me not. Yeah, there you go. She loves me. She loves me not. There is no, there's no maybe. It's either true or false. Um, so these these three data types. There's a few others, but these are the ones that we're going to focus on right now. That they're called primitives because they they represent one thing. Um, if I want to represent the name of a job, I can represent that in a string. But what if I want to represent other things about a job, like the salary and uh, the title, whether or not it's a manager position, stuff like that. Now we have a more complex thing that we're trying to represent in our computer program. So we need to combine some of these things together. And the way you do that is with, in Go, it's called a struct. So here we have a job and it's a new data type that we're teaching to our computer. And this job has a title and it it's, has a, something called isManager, which is a string and a Boolean. So see how we took these two primitive data types and combined them into a more complex data type. And now our computer knows what a job is, or our Go program can know what a job is. Same thing with person. A person has an age and a name, which are an int and a string, which are our primitive data types. But then it also can have a profession, which is of type job. So it can take some primitive data types and some complex data types and combine all those together in one new data type. Is it making any sense? I've never seen those Russian yeah. dolls that you can stack inside. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what that's kind of alluding to is. The Russian nesting doll? Yes. Yeah. You can kind of, so you can create more and more complex data that you want to represent in your program. So representing a name is easy, and you can use you can just build on top of that to represent people or places or I don't know anything. As long as you can, if you can make some type of model out of it, then you can uh, like this with the simplifying the fields into primitives, then you can nest those knowledge deeper and deeper and have a really cool program. So these are called fields or properties. Um, and then we'll talk about later, but a struct like this can also have what are called functions or methods associated with it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The last one we're going to care about is called an array. It's also called a slice and go. I'm not going to differentiate between the two. Um, but an array is just a collection of one type of thing. So for example, this is an array of strings. strings. How did you know there are strings? It doesn't look like it. Yes, because the quotes. We have a string of characters. So how many strings are there in this array? Three. Three. Um, so that's an array. And you can have an array of anything. So I can have an array of booleans. I can have an array of ints. I can have an array of structs. I can even have an array of arrays. It can get a little nuts. But that's what you, so if I need to represent a person, I would use the person struct. If I need to represent people, I would use an array of person structs. Okay. Yeah. For arrays in Go, I know some programming languages say, like, so there would be three there, but there would actually be it would consider it four because, like, sorry, zero or. Right. So we actually weren't going to get into this today, but let's talk about it for a minute. Um, so in most programming languages, all the good ones, um, <laughs> it uses what's called zero based indexing. So instead of saying that this first element 
is number one, we say it's number zero. So this would be zero, one, and two. So there's still three elements in the array, but if I want to access the last element, instead of saying index two, index three, I say index two because it started with zero. So zero, one, and two. Um, that's not going to come up so much in our example today, but it is important to know. Uh, any other questions about data types? You're all experts on this now? Cool. I've been an expert my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to talk about variables. We're going to start with some algebra. What is y? Who can answer? 13. What? 13. 13. Sounds right to me. Um, <laughs> What's the data type of Y? Int. An int. Great. How'd you know that? The number. Yeah. So, and these, these two are ints. And okay. So, how'd you find out that Y is thirteen? Two times five. Use algebra. Okay. <laughs> Use algebra. How did you know that you had to do two times five? Next to each other. Next to So, it's like a system of it's a system of equations. So. We have two variables here, but fortunately, from this equation, we know that x is 5. So we can just plug x in right there, say 2 times 5 plus 3 equals 13. Very cool. Um, so variables, they're cool. People get hung up on variables when they're first starting sometimes, but it's just important to remember that x is just representing some number. As long as you remember what x was before, you can use, you can figure this out. So x was set to five, so we just plug x in, or we plug five in there, and it's as if x never existed. Um, okay, let's do a similar one. Now, what is y? I don't know. Okay, you don't know. Why don't you know? I don't know what the entry fee, price per game, or number of games played is. Okay, I would argue that you don't know what the values of these things are. But you should probably still be able to tell me what is y. OK, it's an int. We know it's an int. That's the data type. How much money you're going to get per game of people playing. OK, so this is the total cost of someone going to an arcade, right, or something like that. They have to pay some entry fee. They have to uh, pay some price for every game they play. And then depending on how many games they play, that's going to affect the total price. So even though we don't know the number, we were able to figure out what Y represented to us. So we could have renamed Y to like total cost. Um, and then we can plug in numbers and get a, an answer, but that's sort of not really what's important about this. It's not the answer, but I just wanted to point out that in algebra, we always use like X, Y, A, B, C, I, like one letter variables. We're not gonna do that in programming. When you're writing a program, you're going to give each of your variables a meaningful name that means something. That way, when you combine these variables, you'll be able to tell what are these, when I combine these things, what does it mean to me? Um, so Y is not a meaningful variable, but total cost is meaningful. Make sense? Question? Are you experts on variables now? Um, so real quick, we use variables to remember values. We'll see that a little later. Um, variables are an abstraction for values. Just how like we we're talking about, we're going to give a meaningful name to each of our variables. It's because we want that variable to represent some true value. So for example, um, on this example, this number of games played, that's an abstraction for how many times someone's going to put a quarter in a machine or whatever. It's not the actual value itself here necessarily, but it's representing that. I just want to use that term abstraction um, because you'll hear that a lot as you start learning programming, and it's good to get exposed to it early. Um, var variables can only hold, <coughs> excuse me, variables only hold one type of data in Go. This isn't true for all programming languages, but when you have a variable, that variable is always going to be an int or a string or a person. It's never going to change to something else later. And then finally, we have to do what's called declaring your variables in order to use them. So you might get an error uh, in your program as you run it that says this variable does not exist or it's not declared. And that means you haven't told the, you haven't told Go, hey, I want to remember an integer or I want to remember a string. You have to tell Go, 
I'm creating this variable because I want to remember this value at some point in the future. We'll get into all that later. Okay, next one we're going to talk about is the assignment operator. So x equals 5, x equals 7. What is x? 7. But x equals 5. So what gives? Go ahead, Stephanie. And we overrode it with seven. X can only be one thing at a time. Just right. So in math, this equation, this is, what is it? System of equations makes no sense. X cannot be five and seven. But in programming, it's, it's different. We're not saying X equals five. We're saying I want X to be equal to five. I am setting X to five. So at this point in time, X is five. But then the next line of code, we're saying, I want x to be equal to 7. So I don't care what was there before, but x is now 7. So by the time we get to the end of this little program, what is x? 7. Question. Yeah. So if you first set it to 5, you can't change x to cat, right? Right. right. Yeah. So because x started as an int in Go, it's always an int. In other programming languages, you can change it because they're crazy. Yeah, in JavaScript. <laughs> so we're going to do a little pop quiz, um, but it's important to remember that the equal sign in Go, in most programming, language, programming languages, is called the assignment operator, not equals. So it means I want you to take whatever's on the right side of this assignment operator and store it on the left side in that variable. Um, so here's x equals 5, x equals 7. What is x? 7. x is 5 y is 7 plus x. What is x? x is 5. y is, y is 12. Yeah. So we used, we took x, or we took 5, put it in x, then we plugged 5 into x here. 5 plus 7 is 12. So y ends up as 12. OK, what about this one? x is 7. This, this could be confusing for people at first. If you think of it as an algebra equation, it's not algebra. Remember, until, but first we have to figure out what's the value on the right side, and then we can take that value and stick it on the right side. It doesn't matter that x is on both sides of this equal sign, because we have a value for x, it's five. So we'll plug five in there, we'll get seven, and then we'll put seven on x. Okay? Cool. And, oh. Here's a good one. What is x? Hello, comma. Um, just because it's not numbers, in algebra, uh, Mariah, I need help with the computer. Um, he does not like to stay attached to the Wi-Fi. Yeah. The airplay. Do you want to plug it in, Troy? You can plug it in with the thing. In oh, no. out. It's OK. I prefer the Zoom. Okay. Um, yeah, in math, we always deal with numbers, but in programming, we can deal with anything. We can deal with strings, we can deal with persons, we can deal with jobs, whatever we can, if we can create a data type for it, we can deal with it in a program. Um, so Go knows that when you're trying to add these two strings, you're not looking for a number. What's the data type that you're looking for? String, string. So it's just going to, what we call, concatenate these two things together. And you end up with Hello World. Questions about any of these? Following along? Is this far too simple for everyone? Does this feel useful? As long as it's useful for one person, I feel like it's worth it. Okay. But we're like halfway through. So just get over it if it's too easy. Um, <laughs> control flow. Uh, I always think about control flow as a bouncing ball through a sing-along song. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's the order in which your program is going to execute. So for example, let's say we have a robot that knows how to make sandwiches, and we're writing a program for that robot. Um, this is the lines of code we've written for that robot. We want it to buy peanut butter, bread and jam, maybe on Amazon or something. They'll get shipped. Uh, then it's going to lay flat two slices of bread, slice one and slice two. It's going to open the peanut butter, lather the peanut butter on the knife, spread the peanut butter on slice one, open the jam, lather the jam on the knife. 
That just sounds wrong, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Uh, to spread the jam on slice two, and it's going to combine those two and serve them. So control flow dictates how our program executes each of these lines. It's always going to execute them in order. It's never going to jump to line two before it's finished with line one. So all of line one will be executed, and then we'll go to line two. This is an important concept because there's certain things in a program that can change the way that control flow flows through a program. So you need to have this concept in your mind that there's a bouncing ball going to each line of code and asking, should I execute this line of code or should I skip it? Am I finished executing this line before I go to the next line, et cetera. Um, so control flow is the order in which Go will execute each line of code you've written. In Go, control flow always starts in a function called main and a package called main. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. But as long as you can, if, you, if I give you a program, for example, if it's just a bunch of text like the one we just saw, as long as you can find where it starts, then you could follow the path that the computer will execute the code. Does that make sense? You need to know where it starts. Um, it's important to be able to mentally execute a program the same way that Go would. Cool. Okay, functions. Not yeah. worry about like async await stuff with Go. No, not like you do in JavaScript. Yeah. Let's go simple. That's <laughs> There's a reason I evangelize Go. Um, JavaScript too. JavaScript is good. I like JavaScript, but I hate it too. Um, so. Let's talk about functions. I feel like functions are sometimes uh, kind of scary for people that are new to programming, but you use, you've used functions, I think. Here is an example of using a function in Excel. So what is, what, can someone explain this Excel sheet to me? It's actually a Google sheet, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're taking the sum in the total class form, and you're taking 20 and 10 and adding it together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're taking uh, whatever's in column in this cell, which is $20, uh, and whatever's in this cell, and we're adding them together with this function called sum. And look, see how there's a little equal sign here? We're saying, I want to assign to this cell with the assignment operator, whatever the result is of this sum function. Follow that? So we're passing in 20, we're passing in 10, and then what's going to show up in this box? 30. So my question to you is, is 30 in this box, or is there a function in this box? Or does it matter? For example, let's say I wanted to do another function on this side, and I wanted to use 30. Could I do that? Yeah. Yeah, because as far as that function is concerned, it doesn't care if 30 came from a function or if I typed in 30, it doesn't care as long as I'm giving it a number. Does that make sense? So for the purposes of writing a, more onto this Excel spread, spreadsheet, as long as there's a number in this box, um, that'll work just fine. So this function has two input parameters. Call them input parameters. So this one <coughs> takes two integers. And then it has a return result, which is the sum of those two things. Um, and we can use the same exact function with different input parameters to get a different answer. Questions about functions? So here's a function for our you know, making a sandwich example. Um, we define a function up here called spread, and it takes as its input parameter bread slice and a spreadable ingredient. Then down here we have the actual program where it executes. So control flow is gonna, as it's going through this program, it's gonna skip this code right here because we're not using that function right now. It just exists. But right here we have our actual code that we're executing. So we're gonna buy our peanut butter, we're gonna lay flatter slices of bread, and now we're gonna spread on slice one peanut butter. So control flow is gonna jump into this function. It's gonna take the bread slice and the spreadable ingredient going to open the spreadable ingredient, it's going to lather it on a knife, and it's going to spread the spreadable ingredient on the bread slice. Then we're going to do the same thing with slice two and the jam. Then we're going to combine those two slices and enjoy lunch. Make sense? What a fun example. <laughs>
Uh, cool. So we create functions to reuse some behavior, like spreading stuff onto a piece of bread or summing two numbers. Um, functions can take input parameters, and they can return results. But they don't have to do either of those things. Um, so it could take zero input parameters, or it could not have to return a result. But those are things that they can do. And then finally, functions have what we call a function signature. It tells you how to use it. We'll look at an example of that a little later. Um, questions so far? What time is lunch again? Lunch is arriving at 11.45, and they said, allow 25 minutes for some. What? Okay. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, I can't read my analog. But if we ever need to take a break to go get soda or to think, oh, yeah. you're welcome to take breaks. Well, maybe let's, I think I have two more to go through, and then maybe we'll take a little break. OK, packages. <clears throat> Does that then go for again? Um, so package and go <clears throat> is a group of related functions, data types, and variables. So everything we just talked about, um, sometimes we want to group those things together so that we can like give them to someone else to use or so that they're nice and organized, organized together. Um, so it's a group of related functions, data types, and variables. So you guys installed the package before we started going through these slides. Do you remember what it was called? The drawing. the drawing package. What kinds of things do you think the drawing package might do? Draw things? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, yeah. So we might have some functions, data types, or variables to help you draw things. Um, whenever you use a package, you'll see at the top of the Go file you're writing, there will be an import statement, and it'll have the name of the package, or the, the import path of the package. So here's the package that we call func that you'll see all over the place in Go. Um, OK, next one we're going to talk about. It's called the accessor operator. It's this little period right here. <laughs> um, so we use the accessor operator to open a package or struct. Remember how I mentioned a package is a group of related functions, data types, and variables? Well, in order to access what's inside that package, we give the name of the package, then we put a little dot, which lets us open up whatever's in that package and access those things. So for example, Punt, which we just talked about, has a function called println, which stands for print line. So we say punt, the name of the package. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible timing. <laughs> I was just getting going. It sucks. Uh, a quick question. Why is it thumped? Uh, yeah. I actually published a thing from the Go team that says that is how you pronounce the format. <laughs> Thumped. Yeah, it stands for format. Uh, I don't know why they, did. they just wanted it to be short. It is the official pronunciation. Yeah. Go funked. Yeah, so funked. It stands for format. And I use the accessor operator to open that package. And then we can see it has a print line, print line function. And when we pass into the print line function, data type, string. Uh, and then what that does is remember how we talked about CLIs? that will print that string to your CLI. Very cool. Uh, here's another example of using the accessor operator to open a struct. So we have a struct called person. It has a field called name, which is of type string. Uh, and let's say there's some function called get person where you pass in a real social security number. <laughs> it returns a person. Then you can use the accessor operator on that variable person to access the name. And then you could assign that name to the person name variable. Following this? Questions? Cool. It's go time. Do we want to take a break? Yeah. Okay. Come back in five or ten minutes. Don't look at me. You're in charge. Uh, let's, how about at 11.20? That's a seven minute break. If anybody needs a bathroom, it's out the door and down the little narrow hall by the elevators. It's kind of hidden, but it's like this. Um, yeah, the door's open. Yeah, the door's open. Um, and yeah, feel free to grab drinks or anything you want in the kitchen. Um,
Just don't take any of the TVs on the wall. <laughs> that I do recommend not doing. <laughs> So I have, so I organize the events through meetup.com. Like, meetup.com is where I yep. organize uh, And then you can just copy your stuff. Oh, there? Yeah. Um, and then we are, that's tonight we're doing that. So this Friday, we're doing it's part of a bigger nonprofit. Yeah. Um, and that one, you, you come and go, yeah. you throw yeah. yeah, I know meetup. So it's, so Forge Utah runs the Utah Go user group, Women Who Go. Utah and machine learning Utah. Uh, and later I have the So we publish all our events on Utah. We need help. We have a Forge Utah Slack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how, how I do it. Yeah, I think I jumped on the Slack. So did you get the drive? I like, just found this on me. Uh, I actually, we did um, uh, an event, right? Event for the workshops themselves. Okay. Um, <laughs> Technology, yeah, they were looking for International Women's Day. They were looking for somebody, and they, uh, we got in contact with them, and they threw me right on up there. <laughs> and, uh, so there are things that you can get more RAM, more memory in it. Uh, <laughs> oh, you want to go see your desk? I mean, yeah. you're just going to do some things. <laughs> um, no, and so uh, with the event right event, we got a whole team. So, like four gigs, like, like you get this could, it is possible to do it. Fantastic. It, I'm just looking through. It's not going to be, like, if you have two gigs, it'd be like, yes. We've had a whole couple of months to just push this out and get it as many people as we could. The other thing is, <laughs> memory is harder to get. Oh, I'm going to have to work on it. But there's 
it's a part of the dirty bucks is that cheap upgrade that it's like it's cheap. Sorry. Uh, so they took his uh, nameplate and like, put it up on the Yeah, okay, cool. That's what I'm going to your daughter? Yeah. That was like so my wife ran Photoshop and she's still doing this. I need to keep coming. Yeah. I love your old daughter. See, so it's just the right time to so load it up. Finally, this is excellent. Okay. He was like, so like, load up. It doesn't take like, like in 30 seconds just to like. Right? Yeah, it's just so like, long. It's freezing it up. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, cool. Thank you yeah, so much. Hopefully that helps because, yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, it's in, in that way, because these are still big machines, and you can still get life out of them. Yeah. So, I want to get a little bit faster, harder after they were participating. Yeah. Like, yeah. So get it done. Yeah. So. It's hard to get it yeah, hopefully, the, yeah, the next thing with these two is the battery. I've been trying to think about it. If your battery starts to be like weird, like, yeah. it's the new ones are a pain. Like, they, they like, don't know what I want to do. The newer ones, yeah. Right. You have to, to actually do that on the line that's on right now. Like, one of the cells about that, and it has to like, like take it apart and it's like, use a heat seattle. Oh, oh, wow. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So are you following along? Um, good. He's my husband. Well, that's so right. We do a parallel we'll do learning together. Fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah, my wife's, uh, she got her degree in computer science education. Yeah. And so she sure. taught computer science for a while. Oh, that's fun. She's actually like thicker than it. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah, doing, yeah. She's a tech for Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Thanks. <laughs> I think you're like the second person to ever look at it. Yeah. Software. I like going a lot. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Am I supposed to put anything in the message field or just? No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I 
set of slides wasn't enough. Now we're going to use a different set of slides. <laughs> you go to gethandouts.com. What? How long are those slides available, oh, Troy, for the rest of our life? These ones? Oh, I can send them to who, No, it's fine. I'm just joking. <laughs> so gethandouts.com. You ask for a class code, and it's VXNXF. I'm not starting until there's 35 people in it because that's how many we're having lunch for. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, I, this turnout is great. On a Saturday, I almost didn't come. Um, okay, so <coughs> I'll wait a couple more minutes, but my wife's brother, Lindsay's brother, made this website, so if it doesn't work, it's his fault. <laughs> Troy. Yeah. So Women Who Go does have a GitHub repo for slides. Oh, okay. So if you want to put them up there after, yeah. that would probably be the best way to disseminate information. I'll send you a link one day. That sounds great. Um, okay, so I'm sending to your computers right now a slide that says Hello World. Um, and there's a link to something called GoPlay.space. I know we took all that time to install Go on your computers. <laughs> but our first few programs, we're going to do in the browser. So I'll show you what it looks like. Copy that link and paste it into your browser. And you should see a little text editor like this with some code in it already. And it should be a run button at the top. So this little website lets us write some simple Go programs, run them, and see the output all in our browser. So it's just a nice, easy way to get started. Um, see if I can zoom in. So, a question: What is this right here? String variable. Yeah. Just huh? It's a string variable. It's got its name is name. Um, what about this whole thing? Function. What's the name of this function? Main. And what did we know? Is, what did we learn is special about main? Start. It's where it's where what starts. <laughs> Control flow. Yeah. So the very first line of code that this program is going to execute is what? What is it doing? Printing the. Ah, skip the line. It's assigning. Okay. Assigning. Yeah. So you are right. There's some other stuff up here. So we're importing a package. Um, but that's technically done. This is just sort of setting up the file. We're going to say that the first line of code that's actually going to execute is right here on line eight, where we set a variable called name equal to world. And then on the next line of code, we use the func package with the println function to print hello world to the screen. So I run this program. I already ran it, but if you run that program, you should see hello world at the bottom. Anyone have any issues getting that far? OK, then now I want you to, instead of saying hello world, I want you to say, have it say hello your name. He stood on a different website, so it was on the, uh, that. So should everybody be up on this site? Yeah. Yeah, you should be up here typing code and writing it. And I'm not going to give you too long to do that one. <laughs> Well, it works. 
Uh, this, so it's not a variable. It's what we call it. It's just a value. Always. Yeah. Yep. But as far as this function is concerned, remember it's just like a sum function in Excel. Like it doesn't care if name is a variable or an actual hard coded string. It will take those two things and print them out to the screen. Yeah. So that one was pretty easy. We just this said world. I just typed in my name. Pretty simple. Um, let's get a little bit more complicated. Uh, I messed something up. Okay. Next one we're going to do is this variable assignment. Copy paste that one in. And before you run it, oh, you already all ran it, didn't you? I was supposed to show you this one first. Um, I wanted to ask on lines one, two, three, and four, what is X? Wait, that's what we're running. I know. <laughs> you all cheated. Um, so I guess we'll just run it. But X starts from zero because we created a new integer X right here. Remember how I said we have to declare new variables? You go, this is how you declare a variable. Say bar x, and you give it the type of that variable. So we're saying bar x is an integer, and it will always be an integer. But we haven't given it a value yet. So go uses what's called a default value for every integer, for every variable. The default value for an int is zero, because it's just neutral. It's just a nice number. Um, so when we print that variable that we've declared but haven't initialized, we get zero. Then we set it equal to five, and we get five. Then we get five plus two, we get seven. And then finally, we override it completely with 21. Just like those examples we had before. Kyler? I have a question. So in other languages, sometimes when you initialize or declare a variable, it sets it to like undefined or null. Yeah. Is that, why isn't it? Why is it zero and not null? This is just much better. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so some, very, some programs or some languages, if I tried this, instead of saying x is zero, it would say x is undefined. But Go is nice because if I have a, a variable and I tell it it's of type int, I can guarantee you that it's going to be an int. Whereas if this were undefined, that's not an int. So if I try and add undefined to two, I'm going to get an error. Whereas in Go, I won't get an error, I'll just get two. So, I don't know, it's just nice. Is there a notion of null and goal? No. There, yes. there is. Well, yeah. sorry. There is, but um, you have to explicitly set up that situation to happen. So, like, I guess, like, if, so th there are some types that, like, they're, they're, they're zero value or they're neutral value. Yeah. Um, I think maps are. Uh, maps. Maps are nil, so, like, so, like, we can, we can talk about that later, but yeah, there are some, like, pr most primitive types have like a same thing, like either empty string or zeros, but there are other things that are more complicated that have nils. Yeah. Um, okay, let's take, this is fun, let's take some guesses. What's the default value of a bool? It would be false. False, which is sort of similar to zero. Not really, but if you were in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what's the default value of a string? Yeah, we call it empty string, which means it's a string of characters, but there are no characters. <laughs> it's just two quotes with nothing in the middle. That's the default value of a string. Um, I don't know. Those are the primitives we talked about, so let's just stick, stick with those. Um, I wanted to point out, so we use the var keyword to declare a new variable in Go, but there's a shortcut we can use as well, which is Go gives us what's called the, well, I'm calling it, the declare and assign operator. So when I'm creating a new variable called x, instead of putting bar in front, I can also just say colon equals. So bar, bar x equals 5, bar x equals 5, and x colon equals 5, those two things mean the exact same thing. I just want to point that out because you will see, you will generally see this. You have to be aware of this as well because you'll see it. If you're online looking at Go code, you'll see both. 
So like when you're just setting up like how we have like bar x int, you can't do that you're not equaling anything. You could say bar colon equals zero. That would be the same. Yeah. Um, or like she was saying, you could say var var x in basically variable. Yeah, yeah. If you just if you don't have a value, but you know you want to declare a variable, var x in works great. Um, and then I also want to point out once you've so if I didn't have that colon there and I try and run this, it's gonna complain. <laughs> yeah. So it's saying x is undefined. Go is saying. You're trying to use the variable x, and you've never even told me what x is. So I'm not going to let you do that. So that's why we have to declare it. We have to say, I'm creating a new variable here called x. Um, but if I try and do that again, so let's say I try and declare x twice, now it's going to say, you're trying to declare a new variable, but x is already a variable I know about. You're not creating a new variable, so I'm not going to let you do that. No new variables. Cool. Those are just some errors you might see. Uh, so you declare it once, and then you can use it. Uh, oh, I know. All right, we're going to start drawing some stuff. No, oh, don't go to that. i got to remove it. Don't go to that. <laughs> uh, Sorry, just sec. I, I got the mix up here. Okay. So this website here has this cute little thing where you can draw, and we'll have this adorable gopher draw stuff. So cute. <laughs> um, So let me explain how this works. So if you think about the graph paper, um, the graph is like a grid and a zero zero. Right Our gopher is sitting at zero zero and he's looking up. That's where he starts. Okay. Um, and he had we have these functions we can call, just like sum in Excel, except these functions are penned down and you can give a color. Blue. Oh, that's convenient. Uh, you can turn a number of degrees. So if it's positive, he's going to turn right 90 degrees. If it's negative, he's going to turn left 90 degrees, and so on. Um, and then you can have the, the gopher walk a number of spaces. So for example, this gopher is going to turn right 90 degrees, and he's going to walk five spaces. Because the gopher put the pen down, he's going to draw a blue line. Make sense? Um, if we had him pull the pen up and then walk, there's going to be no line. All right? So your goal here is to look at this program and to figure out what the gopher is going to draw. So you have to be able to replicate control flow as the gopher will do it. Is that making sense? I have pen and paper if you want to draw a little graph. Um, You good? All right. All right, let's do it together and then we'll see how right we were. So, our gopher is facing up. He's at zero, zero. The first thing we're going to do is put our pen down. And down. We're going to turn to the right 90 degrees. So now we're facing directly to the right. And we're going to go forward five spaces. So, one, two, three, four, five. Then we're going to turn left and go forward three. One, two, three, and we're going to pull our pen up. Up, uh, four. I think we're using a different color, red. Oh my gosh, look how lucky this is. <laughs> so we just pulled our pen up, and we're going to go forward one space. And then we're going to put the pen down, and we're going to go forward two more spaces. And we're going to say, we did it. All right, should we see if we did it right? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay, so let's run this program. Let's 
see how we did. Turns right, he's walking forward five spaces, walking up three spaces, four spaces. Oh wow, we did it. <laughs> Very cool. Um, any questions about that? So that's what a big part of programming is being able to read the code and follow along with it, just like we just did. It's usually not, or it's often not visual like this, um, but the skill is the same. It's one step. Of, it's one step at a time. You need to be able to follow each step. Okay, I will send that to you now, so you have that example. And the next one we're gonna do is you're gonna have to draw. You're gonna have to write the code to draw some lines. So I'm sending this one to you as well. And the instruction are, instructions are in there. Basically, here in this main function, you can look at the last example we had, where you need to draw a line, a blue line from three comma four to seven comma four. Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Draw a single green line from two comma three to two comma five. So, do you think it would help if I drew up here what you're supposed to end up with? Yes. Is that too easy? No. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. At least not to start. Any questions though? You don't understand what you're trying to do. Okay. If I'm stuck, like that's not what I want. Can you scroll down so we have the list of commands? Yes. That would be beneficial to me. Then <laughs> over. All right, let's see what Tony did. First, let's just see if he did it right. I did exactly. Well. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, well, his walking, he's getting in position, draws the green line. He went over his Kind of did a long That works. Thank you. That works. Thank you. So his gopher kind of did a just a little detour. It's not a nice roll. Um, but he still drew the lines in the right spot, which is really the end result we cared about. So I'm curious, what issues did you guys run into as you were trying to get this to work? I had a syntax error. Okay. I spelled something and put two, T, two Ds in it. So what, do you know what you misspelled? I go, it's pen down. I did pen to down. Yeah, something like that? Yeah. So if you try to do that, it doesn't know what pen to down means, and so your program won't run at all. So yeah, that's no, a good no, one. The part right there is it tells you what line. Yes. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So if you look right here, see how it says 16 2? This 16 right here is the line number that the issue happened on. So it's, everything was fine until line 16, and then it was like, I have no idea what pen to down means. So. Usually, if you look at that line number and go find that line right there, then that'll help you fix your issue. I have a quick question. Yeah. Is the spacing how you break it up into its own little group? Is that just like um, developer preference? Is that how you like to so, it? Or yeah, that, that's a great question. So she asked um, the spacing here. Does that matter or is that just personal preference? Um, and in Go, it doesn't matter. Um, it is personal preference, and Go will sometimes, if you put two spaces, sometimes it'll combine, like just, it'll shorten them into one. So Go is a little bit opinionated about how you make your code look, um, but it doesn't change the way the program runs. Can you share it with other developers, like they're looking ready to turn, is there something that's more like appreciated or common, or does it really matter? Step um, I would say it, it depends one on the language you're using and then also on your company. So most companies will have a style guide of how they want all of their developers to write their code so that it all looks somewhat uniform. Fortunately, remember I said Go values simplicity. Go says we're just going to write one style guide that every Go developer is going to use and it's just going to come with the language by default. And so uh, generally, when you look at Go code from company A and compare it to Go code from company B, they're going to look pretty dang similar in terms of style. Um, yeah, good question. Any other questions? 
Is this space, yes. space available to just like sandbox? This? Yeah, this yeah. whole site. Yeah, yeah, this is just. It doesn't have to be like during this course, like I can go home and just play around. Yeah. This isn't mine, someone else wrote this website, so. You can take credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, okay, so this is a good example. I'm gonna show what I think is a better example. <laughs> it's really good um, Oh, there's a picture of our gopher. So I'm gonna copy paste this quote unquote better example. And I want you to look at this code and compare it to Tony's code. I, I gave you two, uh, in the slide I just sent, there's like a good example like Tony's and then my quote unquote better example. I want you to tell me what's different about it and why I would say this one's better. You're doing what's the difference? You're So you're saying move and then you're giving it the direction and the space at the same time so it's more simple. Then where we're doing turn 90 degrees, now move forward. And ours has two line of text where you're just going. Yeah, so I'm I've created new functions that do multiple steps because I noticed that I was repeating myself a lot. I was turning and moving and uh, what else was I doing? I guess, oh, and then I was drawing lines. I was putting the pen down and then moving. Um, so rather than repeat those steps a bunch of times, like in Tony's example, I'm sorry, I keep going. Um, rather than repeating this, these, these actions a lot, I wanted to see if I could consolidate those things into a more descriptive action. And the goal here is that I want my main program to sort of read like a storybook um, and a storybook that tells me what it's doing. So this storybook is hard to understand. I would have to in, like, I would have to draw a graph paper and figure out exactly where my gopher is going, right? Um, it's hard to do mentally because there's so many individual steps. Whereas this story is a little more succinct and a little more exciting if I were to say so myself. I'm moving to the right two spaces, and then I'm gonna move up three spaces, and I'm gonna draw a line that's green, and I'm gonna draw it straight, and it's gonna be two spaces long. I've also, rather than using 90 and negative 90, which can be hard to remember, was this right or left, is negative right or left, I put those variable or those values in some variables at the top of the program. So we have right, which is 90, left, which is negative 90, and straight, which is zero. I just want to keep going the direction I was facing. So these variables are an abstraction for right, left, and forward. Got it? Abstraction, I use that word again. Um, so this is a good story. Tony's was a good story too, but it's harder to understand. That's suspense. Questions <laughs> <laughs> um, about that? So you can, yeah. Question. Is there a way you can um, like split screen and step through your code as you're Yes. Um, no. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, like watch. So like if we were watching. Like you run it, you want to be able to see the code at the same time. Yeah, like can you step function and, and you can see him do the function and then you step down through a function to see the next. <laughs> Um, Ultimately, like I want to see what happens when you, I, I get all the way down through your first function to uh -huh. where you're drawing the green line straight to, and then I'd like to see how your code moves when you when you move to the right. I'd like to see move, and then why does it have the draw line left instead of straight? I see. Um, well, let's yeah, let's try this and see if this helps. Oops. I don't know if this is going to be exactly what you want, but it's worth a try. So on the left, we have my code. So we'll run this. So he's moving to the right, he's moving up, then he's drawing the line that's green straight, and he turns right once. Oh, it's too fast. But he's here, he drew the line straight, then he turned, he moved right one, and then moved his face in this way, then he moved right again and moved one, and then he drew a line that's blue, and he moved to the left because he was facing down. So he turned left. Oh, OK, I see. Did I answer your question? OK. I think she was also kind of hinting at, is there a way that we can step line by line through the code? Like this? Yeah, we, we call that uh, debugging and programming. And in Go, I never do that. 
uh, but you can. Um, so there's no way to do it in this. Um, so like, in some programming languages or in some programming environments, I can literally pause my program like on this line of code and I can see what's happened up until this point and I wanna, and then I can press play like one line at a time. And you can do that in Go, but you can't do it on this tool. Um, the other way to sort of handle that problem is they use a lot of func.print lens like this and you say, here I am. <laughs> Uh, and then you can print out, you know, a value or whatever, and and then you would know uh, at what point that code stops. Yeah, or... like you'd know when when it executed that code. So right here, here I am. So that, you'll see that a lot in, especially in, uh, I use that a lot. Um, any other questions for everyone? How are we doing on lunch, Brad? Just ready. Oh, maybe we should take a lunch break. Don't look at me, Troy. I'm a, I, that sounds good to me. We're ready for lunch. We have enchiladas from Cafe Rio, beef and chicken, and salad. So we're ready. OK, so I'll just tell you, when we get back, so that last example, we ended up adding, maybe, oh, we ended up adding a move function and a draw line function that combined some of the things we were doing before. Next, well, after lunch, we're going to use this draw line function to draw a rectangle. So how many times do you think we're gonna to have to use draw line to draw a rectangle? Twelve. Three times. <laughs> I don't know what kind of rectangle Mariah is drawing. We use it four times. <laughs> There's four lines in a rectangle. So be thinking about that. One color, one color, one color for me. Just have to make a pretty. <laughs> um, cool, let's have lunch. Change your bar section to a cost. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna change it for anyone else, but I was gonna say that would make a little more sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I sent out the next slide with the instructions. So you're supposed to draw a, rec or a rectangle using that draw line function we just came up with, and it tells you where to draw it. It's supposed to be six spaces wide by three spaces tall. So you guys can go ahead and get started. <coughs> I'm just gonna send out my good and better examples. <laughs> so let's look at the good solution. We'll just call it Tony's solution. Um, so it's pretty good. It reads like a nice story. We're gonna move into position. Uh, so we move left one and then right five. Oh, left one, right five. Here? Does that sound right? How did you move left one and right five and then go up? Because I've turned left, so I've turned this way. Oh, you, and then you went to your right. Okay. So, <laughs> then I draw a line to the right, I go six. Sorry, I didn't understand. Then, I'm three, then I go right again, six, then right again, three, and end up where I started my rectangle. Okay? So, do we think this is going to draw a rectangle? So it tells a nice story. We can see yeah. that there are four lines, and, there's and we end up with a cyan. Cyan? Uh, I see. Yeah, yours is kind of off the line. Uh, right. Cyan rectangle. Oh, you're just asking for the other. Okay, one. I'm going to show you my better example. Oh, if I, if I want to do like more. Eyes. And it's better for the same reason as last time. Now we're going to move into position, and then we just call the draw rectangle function. Now it's very clear what we're doing. We're drawing a rectangle. So this is a nice story. Um, and then if we're curious, what does it mean to draw a rectangle? Then we can go look at that code, draw a rectangle. Now we can see, so we haven't lost any of the detail of our previous story, but it's a little clearer in our main function what's going on. Are you guys following this? Yeah. Um, so our draw rectangle function takes the color of the rectangle, how wide, how long we want it, and how wide we want it, and then it calls those draw line functions four times. Just say draw rectangle. 
Right. So now if we want to draw another rectangle, so we got our cyan one. So maybe we also want a red one that's a little smaller. Now we can run this function. And by only adding one line of code, we've added a bunch of steps to our gopher that's going to cause him to draw another rectangle. Very neat. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. There we go. Cool. Okay. So go back. Do you have a what? Do you have like a move to function? There's not a move to function. Okay. It's, the gopher doesn't know about coordinates at all. He just knows about directions and length. Um, I'm just saying, did you write one? I didn't write one. It sounds hard. <laughs> um, okay, I got one more thing before we take all of this drawing stuff to your, oh shoot, don't look at that. <laughs> this is not a Pictionary game. So I want you guys to figure out what we're draw, what the gopher's gonna draw here. <laughs> and notice that this story is much nicer to read than if it was a bunch of turns and down, pin up, that kind of stuff. So take one minute or so, read through this program, see if you can figure out what the gopher is drawing. Oh, I should tell you, the, the, the triangle is going to draw a triangle with three sides that are five spaces. It's an equilateral triangle. And he'll, he'll start in the lower left corner. Cool. Drawing house. Drawing Tony guessed it. <laughs> He's drawing a house. It's got two rectangles and a triangle. So let's see how it works. He moves up and draws a little green door. He's going to move to the corner of the frame, start drawing the frame. And then finally, he's drawing a cute little roof. Very cute. Uh oh. <laughs> cool. So, we told a nice story about drawing a house. We're going to move. We draw a rectangle for the door, again, <laughs> draw a rectangle for the frame, and then we draw a rectangle for the roof. Um, one thing I wanted to point it out or point out is that Go and all programming languages that I know, you can comment out certain lines. So let's say you have like a long program and you're trying to figure out how it's working, um, but there's some code that you don't want to execute right now. You can just put a double slashes in front of it, and that will comment those lines out. And now your program just will ignore those lines. So if I run it now. You know, we'll only get part of the house. The hands there. So, okay, questions so far? Are you guys ready to take this drawing stuff onto your laptops? We won't be able to watch the gopher anymore, but it works the exact same. So, um, you already installed one of these things. You installed the drawing package, although if you run it again, it's not going to hurt anything. Then we need to install this package called, called Easy Input. What's a package in Go? Who remembers? I do, but that's cheating. That's <laughs> the code that we want to use stuff with. Yeah, it's a, a group of functions, variables, and data types that we want to share to other people. So this drawing package has functions for drawing. Easy input has a function for taking input from a user. So go ahead and install those by running it in your command line interface. Remember how to open that in VS Code? It's a control tilde. Oh, control tilde. And it's go get something. Yep. And then I also sent you another go get called drawing starter. So the goal is to open the drawing starter pa uh, package and to be seeing this <laughs> new VS Code. <laughs> Your package does that automatically? What? It adds 
that to your main when you open up a main doc? No, inside the drawing. So there's three packages we're installing. You already installed one, and then we're installing easy input. Do I have to run this in? And then you're right. In your bash, in your terminal. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Run that in the terminal first. Or run it in. It's right there in the terminal. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then you open this and draw the starter. And then once you do the go get that, yeah, you install the 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 so when you were around the go get this terminal with end yeah. code, that's perfect. and then um, where, where's drawing? Oh, there's another one. Okay, so you need to go back. Yeah. Yeah. So you can actually just file the install code. Back one. Or you can get it. So it's on top of you. I'm in drawing right now. Yeah, I just want to open up this while there's something you can click open. You'll be able to see your intelligence. There we go. So there's the drawing package. Okay, here's two of the two files. Yes. So, what? Oh, you got right right here. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm just looking for the other, the one down below. Um, uh, see, there's two on that top side. Oh, and then you want to be in the drawing starter pack, in that main doc. On that main doc, go right there. Okay, so, uh, Stephanie, uh, so, great. And then open up drawing starter. So what you want to do? There's a drawing starter pack. Uh, you are one more one more drawing starter. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a minute to realize there were three. Yeah, I mean, straight. sorry, where the third yeah. was, because yes. you said there were three. Sorry. And so the very so very top one, that one. Here. Yeah, that's where we're gonna so we're going to be writing. So does that? Uh, Anyone not seeing this right now? Much. Yeah, you're in the right place. Yes, yeah, so open up main.com. Okay, you're in the right place. Right, and then in the drawing starter, go to main.com. Perfect. Yeah, you're just. Uh, uh, okay. uh, I have never been able to talk to this other one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All three of them. Yeah, open up main.com. Thank you. Be good. Be good. You know what I'm doing? Corners. <laughs> yeah. Everyone seeing this? Four months, four years. Last chance before you get left in the dust. Just kidding. Um, okay, so we're going to use our drawing package to draw on our laptops now instead of on that nice website. Um, so there's a couple things that are going to change though. Nice laptops. So now we can't just call uh, draw line anymore because our func that draw line function exists within the drawing package. Remember, group of related functions. So what we have to do is first we have to create a canvas onto which we can draw. And then the canvas has a function called draw line. So the way I create a canvas is I type canvas colon equals drawing dot. And it's going to ask me which drawing package I want. So I select that one. And now see how it has all these things popping up? VS Code is helping us out. Remember, what is the doc called? Declare and assign operator. No, <laughs> that's the colon and equal. Oh, the dot one. The dot? Access operator. Accessor operator. And we're using it to open the drawing package. So the drawing package has a variable called backwards. It's an int. It's got blue, which is a string. It's got a canvas, which is a struct. It's got a function called new canvas. What are we trying to do right now? We're trying to create a new canvas. So maybe we should use this function called new canvas. So I'm going to say drawing.new canvas. And then I'm going to give it a width of 1,000 and a height of 1,000. Any questions so far? Are you guys typing this in as we go? We need to make it a go main. Uh, so if you had the drawing starter, then you can just do it within there. Uh, let's see. Do you have the slides? So we just needed to have a new canvas. So are we all to this point? 
We've got a new Roy, canvas. Can you zoom in one more? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Let me hide some of the stuff. Just right on that door and then right through the hallway. Space out for visuals. Okay, now that we have a canvas, the canvas is a struct. How can we open a struct to see what it has? Start to control it. Same thing, the accessor operator. So let's do canvas dot and see what kind of stuff it has. So it's got a function called draw line. Here's the function signature. It takes a color, which is a string, the number of degrees, which is an int, and the number of spaces, which is an int. So this is very similar to the draw line function we were using before, right? It's pretty much the exact same. It also has a little description. Draw line moves the pen to draw a line. It turns the given number of degrees and then moves it to given number of spaces. Cool. Okay, let's go real quick. Let's just talk about a couple other little things that VS Code does for you. So I mentioned that when you use the accessor operator to open a package or struct, it's going to help you out by showing you what's available there. You can also hold command or probably the Windows key on Windows and then click on something and you'll jump right to that code. So you can open the code in VS Code and then just kind of scroll through and see what are the functions in this code. I'm not, we're not going to look at this right now because it's all a bit, there's a lot of code in here that, frankly, it was hard to write. So, um, so let's stick with the basics here. Um, on the canvas, let's say we want to draw a line. So we do canvas.drawline. And then the colors are defined in the drawing package. So drawing.blue. Dot blue. And let's say we want to draw it to the right. And we want to go five spaces. So the way you run this code is you open up your terminal. You have to CD into that directory. So you CD. Uh, hmm. No, you should be here. Right. You might be in. Everyone type ls. Or pwd. Or pwd. Oh, okay. okay. It took a minute. The goal is to get to your username. Yeah slash go, slash source, slash github.com, slash Troy Leland Shields. That's where we are. OK, good. <laughs> Is everyone there in the Troy Leland Shields folder? Oh, yeah. I should look. So, so PWD stands for present working directory, which is telling you which directory you're in right now. And then CD stands for change directory, which lets you move to a different directory. Do that. Yeah. That's where you so we're all there, and now we need to change directory into the drawing starter directory, because that's where the code is that we're writing, right? So you type cd space drawing dash starter, and then you, then you hit enter. And now when you type pwd, you should be in the draw, drawing starter package. I want to make sure we're all at this point. Are we all good? Okay. Now we're going to execute this code. So when we're on the little browser, all we had to do was hit play. It's not much harder when we're doing it on our laptops. Now you say go run, and then the name of the program, the file you want to run. So the file we want to run is called main.go, and that's where our main function is. So we just say go space run space main.go. And I should be able to hit enter. Oops and have nothing happen. So if that's what happens to you, that's good. If you get an error, that's bad. Oh, did you add? Ah, OK. Let me show you this. Um, if, you have, if you have a little dot in your VS code like that, that means you have unsha unsaved changes. So you may have written the code but you didn't save it yet. So when you run the file, that, that stuff's not there yet. You have to save it. OK, are we, are we all good? Everyone ran it, didn't get an error. But you also didn't see an image, right? So let's, let's make it so we can get an image. Our canvas requires us to save it to an image file. So we have to say canvas.saveImage. And we have to give it the name of an image file. So I'm just going to call it image.jpg. Okay. I think I had a bullet yeah, 
that's the blue instead of the capital letter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, capitalization. Yeah, is I did that one. Too. I guess should we bring that up for like people run into the capitalization? Yeah, yeah. So you'll notice when we were doing our programming on the browser, we used lowercase b blue. But when we're accessing things inside of a package, it's always going to be a capital letter here because in Go. <laughs> When you have a capital letter, that means that's something that you want to be available outside of the package. So we're saying drawing dot capital B blue. Uh, if it were a lowercase blue, we wouldn't be able to use it outside of the drawing package. Just think about like your Facebook permissions, right? Like you have public permissions to see everybody can see your, your Facebook posts or private. That's kind of like the same idea is a capital letter. If you make it, if you use a big capital letter, it means, hey, everybody, you can Look at you know access my stuff in my package or do lowercase it means you can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it saving all this? Is this in our Go folder in our hey, drive? Go this this code? Yeah. No, it's all saving it. Yeah, it's saving it in this directory right here. So if you <laughs> it's your users folder, your username, and then slash go source github.com curly with what is the go folder we created, but it put a GitHub. Yeah. Source. Yeah. And that's how that's how Go organizes its packages. It's always uh, broken down like this. So now, if I run this code, I should still not get an error, but I should end up with an image file, and you can't really see it very well. Let me choose a different color. Let's try cyan. Um, and now there's a little line there. Wow. It's so pretty. Can you make the line thicker? Is that an option? I'm no. not saying. I'm not saying. Hey, Troy, let's rewrite your code. I was no. just wondering if that's. There's, there's no option to make the line thicker. Sorry. Yeah. So I want to make sure everyone can draw at least a line and open the image file. Because if you can do that, then you can go home and draw as much as you want. What? I think we all drew a line. Congratulations, you're all Go developers. You all just wrote your first Go program. Yeah. Yeah. Copy, I just sent you some code. <laughs> I want you to copy paste the draw house function that I just sent you into your main.go file. So it's, it's basically the same code we had before. It's just drawing a house using two rectangles and a triangle. And we're gonna make sure that we can all use that. Draw a house. You have to pass in your canvas. <laughs> now I have a nice house. So I'll give you guys a minute to get to this point. Any questions thus far? There's a problem here. What happens if I if I say go run main.go and then I just hit enter and I don't type anything in? What's going to happen? Yeah, I honestly don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Cool. Seems like it didn't work. Um, so that's bad. We should probably protect our program from bad users like me. So we're going to make sure that the user types something in. And the way we're going to do that is with what we call an if statement. So we're going to say if file name, and we're going to do two equal signs equals empty string, then we're going to print an error message. <laughs> and then we're just going to return, which means stop. It, we're going to stop this ex, the execution of this program. So remember what we talked about the empty string? It's a string of characters with no string, with no characters in it. Um, so if the file name is equal to this empty string, then we're going to execute this code. What do you think we're going to do if the file string file name is not equal to an empty string? Yeah, we're just going to skip this code. So remember how I talked about control flow and how certain things in your program can change the way control flow works? Normally, control flow would go from top to bottom, executing every line of code and executing each line one at a time. This if statement is a control flow statement that can tell control flow to either go into this block of code or to skip it entirely. Meet, right? Any questions about that if statement? Um, something you might see somewhere is that you might see a not equal like that. 
The exclamation point just is the opposite. It means not equal. But here we want to say, if the file name is an empty string, then we're going to print an error message. So let's try that out. Go run main.go. I'm just going to hit enter. How dare you? <laughs> but when I go run main.go and I give it a file name, houseis.jpg, it did not print out that error message, and it said file. Cool. Questions about conditional? Yeah. So you don't need a space between the, print, the uh, quotes to make it blank? Just so a space, good question. The space is a character. And so this is no longer an empty string. Okay. It's like, as far as Go knows, this is like just a regular, it could be someone's name. Okay. Um, but that's a good question. And honestly, if we were to, if we were to really write this program, we would want to make this a lot smarter because I probably shouldn't be able to name my file empty space. So, and you don't need an else statement. You can have an if statement without an else. Yeah, we don't need an else statement, but we can. In Go, you can have an else statement. Like, good job, you named it. You don't have to. You don't have to. So now this function is going to execute either this code or this code, but never both. Good job, you named it. And we got so, okay. I want to talk about one other control flow statement. We want to draw a neighborhood. A neighborhood has more than one house. Um, the way we're going to do that is with something called a for loop. So I'm just going to type this out and then we'll talk about it. So we're going to say for var i colon equals zero. What is the colon equals again? So dollar sign, sign. Also declare an assign. Declare an assign. So we're declaring a new variable called i. We're going to run i. Actually, I'm going to start i of one. Sorry. We're going to run i. While, while i is less than or equal to five, we're going to do something. And then every time we do something, we're going to do something called i plus plus. This plus plus is a special little shortcut operator increment. Yeah, it's, it's called an increment operator. It means I want you to take the number i and add one to it. And that's the new i. So if i is one, i is now two. Um, so for i starts at one, while i is less than or equal to five, I want you to draw a house. Every time you draw a house, I want you to increment i by one. How many houses are we going to end up with after I run this program? Five. Five houses. So if, I'll show you why. Yeah. Um, again, control flow normally would go one line at a time from top to bottom, and it would never repeat lines. But this for loop is telling control flow, I want you to go back and execute this a few more times. So if we run this code. And we call it neighborhood.jpg. Wow. Oh, okay, I forgot something. We got five houses, but they're all on top of each other. Yes! That's my kind of neighborhood. And that's because each house. <laughs> that's what I can afford. Those are townhomes. Um, but each house is going to, once we've ended drawing the house, we're like in the middle of the house. So we need to move our, our pen or our gopher. To the right. Yes. Do it. I think a couple of spaces. So every time we draw the house, then we're going to move to the right. Oops. I should have chosen a shorter file name. Oops. I like it. Very cool. Not the Nesher house. That looks like one of those concept art pieces. Um, I think it has to do with. Great. On that, colon, and then you do a space. The way the gopher is facing when he's done drawing the house. Oh. Sorry, guys. You get the idea, though. <laughs> oh, I figured it out. I figured it out. He turns right, and then he needs to turn to the top again. 
So he needs to turn left when he's done. So canvas that turn drawing that left. Now it's gonna work. That's the money back guarantee. What? What did I do wrong? You told it to turn left right after it turned right. Yeah, but it moved right. What moved to? You just, you just go farther. Yeah. You want three on the house instead of white. So let's see. Oh, top page. There you go. We got two houses. Oh. And then the other five are like off to the off the side. So to fix that, before we start drawing our houses, we could move to the left. Uh, we can move like nine spaces to the left and then make sure we turn up. Anyways, now we're getting in the weeds. This isn't the important part. <laughs> so the important part is how we got a few houses. A few houses. Hey. The important part is that you can use a loop and if statements and input to draw some interesting things. For example, I think in this drawing examples, uh, where was the cool one? Ones? Well, oh, right. here's, here's a star. Uh, there's a nice polygon. You know what? Under homework drawings, my oh, oh. stop sign. Oh, I saw it in there because that's from. See, if you do this enough, computer generated art is starting to sell for tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so just do it enough and get like Troy's weird right angle houses. <laughs> and sell them. Yeah, if you use the drawing. Finance your own startup. If you use the drawing package and you make millions of dollars, I want to cut of that. <laughs> um, Only if we're using your package, Troy. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's cool. You guys can play with that all you can want. You leave the for a couple minutes. Huh? Can leave the for a couple more oh, seconds. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Everybody else is caught up though. We just want to read the yes. for loop. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to. I hope, want you guys to copy this code so you can play around with. Because you could you could draw six triangles in here, a bunch of shapes. Could be you could draw it a thousand times. Um, Thousand so take a couple more minutes to copy this down, and then I, I wanted to get to the last example of doing a chat client together. Um, it, it, it's going to be pretty simple as well, but it's nice because it's different. This is all very visual. It's all about seeing something at the end, whereas the chat client is all about, uh, it's a little more, bit more about logic, and there's no visual component at the end. So. I'll leave this up for a minute. I'll also just send it out to you later, but. Or you could just put it on the GitHub on Women Who Go because that's why it exists. Yeah. <laughs> Troy's amazing. He'll be the first person to publish on it. That's not me. <laughs> oh. oh, it's because. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Save it, save it. 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 And so and we don't open it. Telling, this is where we define which is the block to run five times. It's like when you look at it. And these blocks, that means it's part of the block. So it's not just the indent that it's recognizing. It's not the indent. You say you do Python. Yeah. Python's all about the indent. Okay. So technically, you don't have to indent that. Yes, code. The yes, code will automatically finish. Okay. Okay. Time. Every time I say it, so you put it on your main function too, so it's encompassing everything. Yeah, and you have just like sub. So if you'll notice the main, the main functions. This is the yeah. ending bracket. Yeah. This is the starting bracket. So that's all the main function. You can have it inside the main. Uh, and then right outside the main, this is where we define another function called draw house. And those are it. that's where it's right. Here. That's kind of like your building blocks that you're calling, right? Yeah. That's what we want. We want to pass it through. I, I saved it first. I forgot to save it. 
Okay, well, that's why <laughs> I can read it and delete it. Yeah. Right click, delete. Okay. That, that, that was not happening so long ago. Oh, I well, I'm going to move on to the chat example. Have a I will make sure that you guys have access to this after. Is that okay? okay. So open up your terminal again. We're going to do a cd space dot dot, which means I want to change directory back out one. So you should be back out in Troy Leland Shields. Let's follow this now. It's going. cd space dot dot. And then I'm going to send you another thing. I want you to install that package and this package. It's the chat client or the easy chat package and the easy chat, what's it called? Chat client starter. Did you source it? So you have to search. And once you've installed that, CD easy chat starter. Sorry, I keep getting my names mixed up. CD into chat client starter. Oh, uh, okay. So did you get and then it? open the main.go file there. If you start. Uh, yeah, and then oh, yeah. Please, please, yeah. Here's some, some tips about working in the command line. If you start typing a name and then hit tab, it will auto complete it for you if it's available. Okay, okay. So he says, very nice. Okay, now he's saying go back a directory. And then you have to install these two things go get. Oh, did you install the chat? I just typed Oh, easy chat and chat. I installed it. All right. Are we all looking at this file now? Okay. Are we good? You got, are we all good looking at the chat client starter main.go? All right. We're going to go. Emma. Chat client? No. Chat client starter, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, open. So we're going to start. Step one is we're going to take some input from the chat user. How do we take input on the last example? Anyone remember? We asked them, and then what function did we use? Type in the. Oh, plus take input. Yeah. So we use the easy input package. Easy input. We're going to use dot, and it has a function called take input. And what did we, so it returns a string. Here's the function signature. It's called take input. It takes no parameters, but it returns a string. And what do we do with the string? We did a prompt before. So that's a good point. Let's add the prompt in first. So we did prompt.println. And the thing we're going to ask them right now is what's your username? We're going to take input and we need to remember the thing that they input. So we're going to create a variable called username, colon equals. Um, the other input we need for them to give us is the IP address of the chat server. So the way this is going to work. No, no, we're not saying you did anything. We have one person. We can fix it. We have my computer. Of, of going My MacBook. Oh, so that's the chat server. So the goal group is looking for that location and whatever. You and the chat server's job is to just let chat clients connect to it. You have these. All of your guys' laptops are called clients. We're all going to connect like this. And then when someone sends a message here, the chat server is going to send that message to these two people. That's basically the extent of what we need to understand right now. Any questions about that? Okay, cool. That makes more sense. So, in order for you guys to be able to connect to my computer, you have to be able to type in the IP address of my computer. So, we need another input, which is function. We're going to prompt the user and say, what's the IP address? 
and they're going to say IP address colon equals the input dot this is making sense? Sorry, this isn't super immediately related, but um, when you don't provide a type, is it just inferred? Yeah, so because take input right here, because it returns a string, um, we know the username has to be a string, so it is inferred. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so once we have a username and IP address, we can use the easy chat package. I'm going to hit dot. And the easy chat package has something called the chat client, which is a struct chat message, which is a struct, and it has a function called join chat room, which sounds like something we want to do, right? I'm trying to join a chat room. And what are the input parameters to join chat room? Looking at this, any guesses? What? Username and IP address? Username and IP address. So, we oh, start typing join chat room, we can hit enter, and the first parameter is the IP address, which we have now. The second parameter is the username. Um, and easy join or join chat room returns a struct called a chat client. And it also returns an error. So we haven't talked about this yet, but in Go, each function, remember how I said a function can return something, but it doesn't have to? So in Go, a function can return zero things, it can return one thing, or it can return multiple things. So this function returns two things, chat client and an error. Now, this easy input take input, it only returned one thing. And so we took the input and we stored it in a variable called IP address. Now that we're taking, or that we're returning two things, we have to have two variables. So the first variable is gonna be called chat client, and then we're just gonna hit comma, and the second variable is gonna be called error. So because chat room, join chat room returns two things, we have to have two things available to store those things. Does that make sense? I'm trying to move quickly so we can finish this in the next 15 minutes. So I apologize about that. What? Um, Man, that went fast. <laughs> so um, the way this works, let's say the user had typed in the wrong IP address, then we're not gonna be able to join the chat room because it's not up and running. So that's why we need to be able to handle this error. So it's either gonna return a chat client that's successfully in the chat room, or an error to tell you, hey, something went wrong. So if there is an error, we're gonna say, if error is not equal to nil. Ah, oh, somebody asked that. Yeah, then we're gonna thump that print line, we did something wrong, we're gonna print the error, and then we're gonna return. So this is very similar to our if, file name equals equals empty string. Like it means something went wrong. So we're saying if the error is not equal to nil. Nil means there's nothing. So if it's not nothing, that means there is an error. Does that make sense? It's very confusing, but. <laughs> um, so for example, if I try and run this right now, go run main.go, type in, hold on. Let me just try this. Okay, I'm just making an error go away. So if I try, I'll type in my username Troy, and then I'll say what's the IP address, and I'll just say 0000. Then it says you did something wrong, error connected to the chat server. So I couldn't connect to the chat server. Good, our error works. <laughs> um, Troy, can you, there we go. Thank you. Easy so I want to make sure that we can all get to this point. So I'm going to go ahead and run the chat server. And I'm going to send you guys my IP address. I just sent it on the handouts app. Uh, give me just a second. Okay, so this right here 
is the chat server up and running. It says, let's name for connections to chat room. The name of the chat room is Women Who Go. Just type in. Now, with the code you guys have written so far, hey, look, somebody connected. Macy <laughs> connected. Good job, Macy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, no, way to be here. So, let's see. Can anyone else get connected? Do I need to show the code again? Yeah, yeah sorry. So close. <laughs> so you just have to. Yeah, here's the. So oh, he's right where you are. So he just added. You have to add this bumped up from on my end, unfortunately. We do need to add that. Yeah, yeah. The reason you have to do that is because. If you declare a variable and then don't use it anywhere, Go gets mad at you. So you just needed to use it somewhere. Uh, if you just add this bump dot print line at the end. What's the IP address? Hey, we got another person. Where is easy? Jeff said, hello world. Am I running? This is another package that we imported. Oh, okay. Okay. What? Let's see. Let's do LS. Let's see. Anyone having trouble connecting? Oh, we got so many connectors. Oh, You're all hard to destroy. Why does it disconnect you immediately? Um, yeah. Question. Um, yeah. Because as soon as we connect, we don't do anything after that. The next line of code is that we print out the chat client, and then our, code, our program's over. So our program closes, as far as our program knows, like it executed everything we told it to. So, yeah, that's a good question. That's why Kat didn't work. Because she was don't stay connected to the address. Yeah. Valid connected, let's see. Huh? Oh. He's connected. Oh, it's there. Emma's there. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. We're going to get there. Okay. Wait <laughs> another minute. Snark. Hey, Snark. now, put your username. So whatever name you want. Yeah, we got it. So, that's great. But as you guys pointed out, this is useless for a chat server, for a chat room because I can't actually type anything in, and I can't receive any messages because as soon as I connect, I disconnect. So. We need to, fortunately, our chat client, we use the accessor operator. We can open it up. We see it has a function for receiving a message. It has a function for sending a message. We're going to start with receiving a message. Um, so I'm going to call chat client .receive message. And can anyone tell me by looking at the function signature, what does receive message return? It returns chat message. Okay. So, because it returns something, we need a variable for that. So we're going to say chat message colon equals chat client dot receive message. And what do we want to do with this message? Great, we got a message, but what do we want to do with it? Respond. Send it. Yes, before we can respond, we need to be able to read it. So we're going to say bumped dot println chat message dot body. Chat message is a struct. And it has a field called body. <laughs> well, we should also probably print chat message dot chat message dot from. Okay. Now, if I run this thing, run my name or get my name. Uh, I got a message here. Do you guys get that message? This message is from the chat room. The chat room is called Women Who Go. That's the first message you get when you connect. Now, you used localhost. I used localhost because I am running the chat server. You guys have to use my IP address. Um, still not useful <laughs> because I, I'm only getting one message for one, and I'm not being I'm not able to send any messages. So the next thing we're going to do is be able to send one message at least. You do, but you need it. So we're going to say chat client dot send message, and we want some message text. Where do you think we should get the text from? Highlight that too. Uh, user input. Uh, user input. input. And how do we get user input? It's not the client. 
Oh, easy input. So we're going to say text colon equals easy input dot take input. Now I'm going to run the program to ask my username, my IP address, and it says women who go, and now it's just waiting. What is it waiting for? To say something. It's waiting for me, the user, to type something to send to someone else. So I'll say hello. But then it exits. But we can see I did type hello. So I want to see if you guys can all type something to the chat server. And we got eight, seven minutes. We're going to get there. Huh? Back to the code. I'm sorry. Oh, somebody said something. Great. Travis, are you speed typing over there? <laughs> Is that why you stole the computer away from your daughter to speed type? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That means that Macy's next goal is to type faster than her dad. <laughs> the Emma, you already posted, don't you? Can anyone else see the message? <laughs> yeah, no one else will be able to see the messages yet, except for me on the okay, chat server. So, yeah. so it's like we're getting a lot of messages coming in. That's good. <laughs> Is this is pretty, pretty cool. We're sending a message. So we're sending it to the server. So if you run it, uh, send, yep. Message. What? What? Go right. 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 We joined the chat room, and then we received the first message from the chat room. And the first message is always a welcome message that says, welcome to the chat room. Then we wait for the user to type something in, and then we send that to the chat room. But then we close our program. So we're never able to take another, another message from the chat room, and we're never able to ask the user to send another message. So really what we need to do is we need to infinitely be receiving messages. We need to infinitely be asking the user what they want to type. Um, I was hoping we'd have more time to go over this, but we only have five minutes, so I'm just going to kind of show you the final solution and we'll talk through it. Um, so let me open up the chat client. So now what we do is we join the chat room, and then we have a function called receive messages loop and send messages loop. So <laughs> we have to talk about this go keyword for a minute. One of the things that Go does really well is what we call concurrency. Remember how I talked about control flow, there being one bouncy ball bouncing through your program? Well, sometimes you might want like two bouncy balls going through your program, doing two things at once. So when we say Go, and then we give a function, what we're doing is we're taking that one sing-along ball, splitting it into two. We're saying, one of these sing-along balls go execute this function, and then the other one just keep going and executing the other function. So we're going to look at these each one at a time, but our program is doing them simultaneously. So the first one is the receive messages loop. Remember how we talked about a for loop and how we can do something a set number of times? Well, this for loop doesn't have any number of times. We're just doing it infinitely. We're going to infinitely wait for messages from the chat server. So for, and then this block of code, it's just going to keep repeating. So every time we come in here, we're going to wait for a message to come from the chat server. When the message comes, then we'll print it out with this func.print function, just like we used before. That's the receive messages loop. We're just constantly waiting for the next message. The other side is the send messages loop. <clears throat> Again, it's an infinite for loop right here. And <clears throat> it's doing the opposite, though. It's waiting for the user to give some input. So we're going to execute the code. And we'll wait until the user types something in. Once they do, we'll check and make sure it's not an empty string. Um, if, so if it equals an empty string, continue just means skip to the next iteration of the loop. So it's just going to go back to the top. Um, but if it's not an empty string, then we'll skip this if statement, and we'll send the message. So um, this is a lot for you to type out in like 30 seconds. Oh, wow. Um, 
but we have to get it working so that we can chat with each other. So I'm trying to think of how the best way is for me to send copy it. To you. Can you send it on a handout and then you can copy the code? Oh yeah, I'll send it on a handout. Great. I'll just send the whole thing. <clears throat> wow, handouts is working great for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can copy that whole thing and paste it into your program. And then we should all be able to chat with each other. Yeah, you'll have to paste it over what you have, but it's very similar to what you already have. Let's do command A. Yeah. Oh, I also got to tell you, if you need, well, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> oh, that's pretty fun, though. No, hit save. Let's see. Uh, that's fun. Yeah, it lost all formatting. What? This one giant line of Well, there should, oh. <clears throat> Wait. Are you able to reformat it? Yeah. Uh, oh, we did. Oh, the handout sucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> command shift. Was I hitting the wrong one? No, it might have been. Mine worked. Try command shift V. Shift V. Yeah. All right. Oh. Mine did that oh. for my username. Who else is having that issue of like it just Same. pasting all it's on one line? No, mine pasted fine. No, oh, ours was good. So You're on your own, shall I? Uh, what's your IP address again? Somebody else will send something and interrupt. Them. All right. <laughs> what? Yes, you know. That's You're true. saying we shouldn't run chat servers off the command line? <laughs> <laughs> All the time? Oh, God. So bad. <laughs> Slack via command <laughs> line <laughs> only. <laughs> so, Kevin asked, how do you end it? Since there's two infinite loops, this thing's just going to run forever. So. Your laptops are stuck like this. <laughs> okay, um, you just hit Control and then C. That's the close command. It'll, it, it'll end your program. <laughs> cool. Wow, 201. Great timing. <laughs> well, I want to encourage all of you guys. I think all of you should come next week to the Intermediate Go workshop. Um, it'll be more tailored to all of you now, um, now that you're all experts in Go. So, yeah, Ryan, you like? Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing. We're having an intermediate one next week. Uh, Troy will not be here. Dang it, Troy, you said you were busy. Yeah. Um, but my friend uh, Zach Badgett from Rakuten uh, will be doing that one. He's done workshops with us before, so uh, that'll be good. Um, I forgot what we were doing, but he had a plan. Oh, it's on uh, Eventbrite or <laughs> com, or just show up here tomorrow at the same time. Sorry. I'm sorry. Next week, same time, same place. Um, and yeah. yeah. Uh, we're done. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna throw the women who go email up here in case somebody wanted to contact me. Um, and this website was for Troy and Lindsay stuff. Yes. Yeah. So if any of you ladies or any of you guys who know ladies that might uh, want to learn more about coding, Troy and I, we've already done our pilot program and we're looking to start a beta with like uh, six to ten women. It would be completely free after work hours. Um, so if you're interested in wanting to learn more coding and do more, it's 
more full stack, but we start with Go learning back end first. So um, you can go to our website right there. Please pardon any typos or weirdness, which Chalet already found for us, because we're pretty, we're pretty uh, ghetto. <laughs> So um, anyways, you can go there and just uh, see if you want to know any more. We'll let you uh, know info on like when we're going to start and how long it's going to take, all that kind of stuff. That's all we got. So yeah, here's our contact information. Uh, feel free to hang out and ask questions and chat as long as you want. Um, and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, yeah, that's all we got. And I just want to give Troy a hand.